given the lack of a challenge rating or any other kind of mathematical formula for figuring out the difficulty of an encounter in old school versions of Dungeons and Dragons, a lot of folks on Twitter especially have asked me, how do I balance encounters for my group? And I'm going to talk about that today and how I use the power of the dice to determine the outcome of an encounter today on Daddy Roll to One. Hello there, and welcome back to Daddy Roll the One. I'm Martin, and this is another video on my series on DM advice, especially for new DMs, but I think old timers a lot of times have found that it's helpful, actually helpful for them too, as they're hearing things in a different way that they just hadn't thought about before. So before I get started, two quick qualifiers here. The first one is that this is going to be uh, much shorter than some of my more recent videos, partly because if you saw my last video that I did on uh, the original thumbnail was about how women had different ability scores in early d and I was referring to a specific article in Dragon Magazine. That video is actually about coverage of two issues of Dragon Magazine. I mentioned how my allergies were really bad. Um, so uh, I ended up getting a sinus infection. It's just, it's a long story that I have with my sinuses. And so um, I've been sick for over a week and um, my voice is shot and um, just still not feeling great. So I'm just going to do a quick video today and uh, I'll get back to the longer form ones soon. I know a lot of people actually uh, seems like they prefer that from the feedback I've been getting, which is um, good to hear. So <clears throat> excuse me, we'll be getting back to those. Secondly, um, I know a lot of people that prefer my D&D history videos actually just kind of skip past these DM advice videos. And I get it, you know, watch and or listen to what you like. Um, but if you could just help support the channel by can just giving it a like and a comment, even though if you're not going to watch all the way through, I, I would appreciate that because it will help the channel to grow. Okay, so what I'm talking about here is um, how do I balance encounters? So this came up um, a couple different times somewhat recently. So uh, I was having a conversation on Twitter and this particular person, she was running, um, actually, I think it was a 5e adventure, but the question that she asked and the advice that I gave is going to be consistent, irrelevant of the addition. And what she said was she had bought a prepackaged adventure, a purchased adventure, and she had fewer players than it called for um, on, on the uh, adventure marketing speak. And she mentioned that um, I think what happened was, um, you know, one or two of her players didn't show up. And she was like, I wasn't really sure how to balance this because it said you needed this many people. And so she said, how do you guys do that? What, what do you do? Um, to balance the encounter. And my reply was basically like, I don't, I run it as it was written, I guess, or as I usually, you know, usually I'm running kind of a combination of something that was pre-written that I've changed. And then I run it my own way. And, um, and I explained that like, you know, basically the encounter is the encounter and it doesn't change depending on how many people are there. So I know that's probably contrary to how a lot of people plan, um, but, you know, especially when you get outside of like that kind of post, you know, third edition and post era of D&D where there were challenge ratings built in to try to help DMs figure out how many creatures you needed to have. And there was mathematical formulas to calculate like a challenge rating of this means that you need this many party members of these levels to, to for that to be a significant challenge without overpowering the players and stuff like that. I just don't play that way. Stuff is there in the world. And the way that I balance it, so to speak, would be um, by using rumors and foreshadowing so that the players know what they're getting into. And then making sure the players are aware of the fact that they have options that don't always have to involve combat for how they can get out of situations. And then lastly, using dice. Um, this is a dice box, which is why I just touched this that my friend made for me um, with this kind of Cthulhu design, but uh, using dice to kind of help figure out what's going to happen during an encounter rather than me um, scripting it out ahead of time and having, um, you know, a solution already in mind of what's going to happen. So I just want to talk about really quick how to, how I put all these together to give you some examples so that you can see here. So um, if you have been following these videos, you know that in the last time I talked about this campaign that I run for my daughter, so a couple of the players um, had left. So there were two sisters in the game. There were six players total. Two of them were sisters, and their family ended up moving. Um, and the sisters uh, opted to not continue to play. I, I did offer that we could try to Zoom them in or Skype or whatever. 
And uh, they said, no, they, they weren't really into doing that. So um, now we had four players in the game. I, I decided to retire their player characters rather than have them be taken over by anybody else in the group. Because uh, I don't necessarily always like people having to play more than one character. If you've got a character and then, and then um, you know, hirelings or henchmen or whatever, that's fine. Um, but trying to run more than one character, I mean, some people can do it. Um, my players are pretty novice, so I didn't really want to give them that extra pressure of having to try to run two different characters. So that said, though, um, I didn't really change how I built the encounters that came up. So you see here, these are my notes. And, you know, if, if you recall, again, from before, I have another smaller notebook that I take like little scribble hand notes in. And then eventually I organize all those and then I type them up. Um, and print them out and then I cut them cut those out and and paste them into my book so um, what I was doing here this is an adventure that was from Dungeon Craft uh, by profession Dun professor Dungeon Master and this particular scenario is called the Demon Skull I'm going to give you a link to that video it's a whole um, encounter that you can run uh, and he does it in one video and I kind of copied that format for here but then I you know I had to change it to fit into my campaign world but um, what I was working on here was this idea that these characters and NPCs that the players had met over time um, were going to keep impacting what was happening in the campaign and we're going to keep coming up over and over again. And so because they kept showing up over time, the players would kind of start to almost trust them. And so then when things happened that kind of betrayed that trust, it was a big deal that that would happen. And they were kind of left to wonder like, why? And so one of the things that I was doing, though, was also listening to my players, which is very important as, as a DM, listen to what your players want to do. So I've mentioned before, I mentioned this pretty much every time, the session that I plan out is the next session. I don't plan farther ahead than that. Every once in a while, I might get an idea in my head. It was like, wouldn't it be cool if this happened? But I don't I don't script. I might jot a note to remind myself, but I don't insert that in anywhere unless it just comes up naturally through the course of what my players are doing, because I don't want to force them to do something that they didn't want to do. I, I want them to drive the story. OK, so at the end of that last session, when those two girls had left, the two sisters had moved, um, I really quickly asked the four remaining players hey, what do you guys want to do next time? There had been a big combat. People were very wounded. A uh, few people barely escaped with their lives, you know, their characters. And so what they said was, you know, what? we just want to go back to the keep and we, we kind of just want to, we want to rest up. We want to heal. We need to buy equipment. One of the players uh, said, she's, I want to check on the, my wolf pups that are with, um, you know, the, the Skomorok, the, the kind of the bard character. And then one of them, the thief character, she is probably of the four, She's probably the most role playing centric of the group, the one that probably thinks about the game in between sessions more than any of the other players. And she said, my character wants to go buy a guitar. And um, she told me she's like, uh, my character had learned how to play the guitar when she was young. And it, it was like just something that she said. And I don't care. That's fine. It's not going to impact anything. And she says, I want to go basically busking. I want to go out in the street corner, set up a box and play guitar and hope people pay me money for this. And I don't really know where she was going with this, but I was like, yeah, like, let's let's do that. Like, let's have that happen. So what I gathered from this is that they didn't necessarily know what they wanted to do next, but they did not want to go back to the caves right away. That was very clear. The case of chaos from uh, the adventure, uh, you know, keep on the borderlands, which is what we're going through. Um, and they kind of just wanted to hang out in the keep a little bit and have some NPC conversations and, and do things. So I, I, we were through a whole thing where they went shopping. They loved doing that. So they went to the provisioner and then they went to the trading post and they compared prices and things like that. That is not something I enjoy, but they enjoy it. So we did that. And then um, uh, and then the thief player went out and said that she was, um, you know, playing the guitar. And um, what I had happen was people were going by. It was it was very busy. It's a market day and people were putting coins uh, into into her box for her playing. And I just had her roll a die to determine randomly how many coins that she got. And she, uh, she thought that was pretty fun. And then um, she found in there, though, a note. And the note was written by this guy, Scabs. Uh, and again, I've stole this character from Professor Judge Master, so credit where credit's due. But um, Scabs wanted to meet 
with um with her and it, it said he was very nervous right so so now i'm i'm kind of driving the story a little bit but it's like i was trying to give them something to do other than just be in the keep and buy supplies and talk to stuff like some stuff has to happen right and now they could have chosen to not meet with scabs and that would have been fine but i kind of had a feeling that they would probably want to meet with him so they um end up meeting with scabs and there's this interaction with this um uh, assassin character. So Scabs uh, basically says like he's come across something, people are after him and he, he hands them a note uh, that's, you know, it's tied up like a scroll. And I actually made the scroll, hands them a note and um, he, and it, and then he says, you know, something should happen to me. And he's hanging the scroll and then he, he gets shot with a poison dart and he dies. And so I use this flow chart. And again, that's, I got this from professional dungeon masters, dungeon craft, but this flow chart of like all these different things that could happen. So how does this relate to encounter building? Well, um, Again, they needed to chase the assassin and, you know, they needed to find clues, but I wasn't necessarily sure, like, are they going to catch the assassin? What's going to happen? So as it happened, like it, the assassin escapes running across the rooftops and they're making checks to see if they can keep up. One of the characters, there's only four, remember, one of the characters couldn't even get up, like couldn't climb, kept failing her climb roll. And so she was never able to follow. The other three um, fell in the course of the chase. So none of them ever caught up to the assassin, but there was a, um, there was a, uh, a contingency for that, which is that the assassin ended up dropping, um, the, the blow pipe, uh, the blow gun that he used to shoot scabs with the poison needle. And then, um, sessions before I had set up this idea that the two elves are being trained by the witch, right? So I mentioned that it was actually three elves, but one of the elves players had moved. And um, so they're being trained by the witch and the witch uses mice and ravens as her, um, as like her messengers. And I'd set that up and I was like, well, I'd mentioned that, but I hadn't really done much with it. And so I had a little mouse run up to them after they find this blowgun with a little message. And it's this, and it's kind of like this idea that like the witch is watching, she's in her tower and she, they know she's using mind altering drugs. And so maybe she's seeing beyond just what's in front of her. And maybe she was aware that this encounter was taking place. And so it was kind of this creepy moment where this mouse comes up, delivers a note and the note explains that this assassin was part of this like green scorpion assassin's guild or whatever it was called. I forget the name. So they kind of thought that was cool. This idea that like, oh, they remember that when, as soon as the mouse ran up and they saw that it had paper in their mouth, they're like, that's the witch sending us a note. And that, so again, I had to set that up. It would have, it wouldn't have had the impact if it just happened. Um, it, the, the idea was that I'd set up sessions and sessions before that, if the witch needed to tell them information, they might find a mouse or a Raven delivering a note to them. And so as soon as they saw it, they knew what that was. Right. So, um, they uh they ended up um uh figuring out that this assassin was part of this group and so they were trying to do some research on that they also the thief player and she was being very very clever in this particular session and so i kept trying to reward her with more and more stuff but she unrolled the scroll from scabs and it was blank and she was like why would he give a blank scroll and so she kind of, they started talking it out and eventually they thought, well, like maybe there's a hidden message on here and how are we going to reveal this hidden message? And they eventually figured out that like, maybe we can put it up to a light and see if there's something on there. Well, it, turned, it wasn't light necessarily. It was heat. I'd written the note in lemon juice, uh, but it was, um, it was a word. It just said tenderloin. And it just turned out that was going to be the password for them to sneak into the headquarters of this, this gang called the swine gang. And, so then she's like, well, I'm in this tavern with all these people that just saw this happen. And she's like, can I use my thieves cant to like start subtly chatting and see if I can find some thieves in here that might be able to give me information about this. And I, I had not planned for that. I hadn't thought that she would think to do that. Uh, it seems natural, but like she's not really ever done this before. And I was like, you can 100% do that. And I don't make her roll. I didn't make her like, you know, make persuasion checks or anything. It was like she was clever, thought of a use for a skill that her character has that she'd never really used before. And I said, yep, it works. You find this guy and he starts talking to you. And she got the information she needed that she was able to skip a bunch of stuff to figure this out. Right. So um, again, relying on player ingenuity to figure this kind of stuff out. So, um, they found that, um, scabs had a thief guild ring on. So she took it, she like lifted it off of his body. She's like, this might come in useful later. And, um, 
And so then they kept, uh, you know, trying to investigate. Uh, eventually things happen. So the part I want to get to is that they end up um, meeting in, in they, they find the headquarters of the swine gang and they break in. And, uh, and the way that they break in is that they had a thought that maybe tenderloin was the password because when they went and they found the entrance and people said password and they were like, tenderloin and that was the thief player and that worked and so they were able to make their way in they go meet with the head of the gang and he's about to attack them and then something else happened and this this doesn't happen a lot in this game but like everybody was just on so earlier in the game in this session um because they were at the keep the two elf players had gone to go see the witch again and th everyone moved up in level and so um, when they had, they moved from first level to second level. Now you'll notice that I'm on session 16. So after 16 sessions, um, they moved from first to second level. I'm sure a lot of people would think that's way too slow. It's just how I prefer to play. And my, my players have never complained. Again, they don't have context. They've never played another role-playing game. So they have no idea if this is fast or slow. I'm sure a lot of people just think it's insane that it's taking this long. But I prefer these, these longer periods of time where they're at lower levels because they're exploring their characters. Also, we only play roughly once a month and it ends up being a little bit longer than that when we take off time for the holidays and things like this. And, um, you know, I don't want to rush it too fast where, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you should level every session or every few sessions. I don't want there to be eighth level right now because they're still going through the Keep on the Borderlands, which is an adventure written for first through third level characters. So I don't need eighth level characters going through there because then it would no longer be challenging to them. Okay, so they are um they go to this uh, the head of the swine gang uh, headquarters and um there's an encounter there but earlier as i mentioned when they leveled up the two elf characters had learned new spells and one of them learned charm person and the other one learned ventriloquism and so as they are chatting with the um the head of the the swine gang um i uh, made a reaction roll and Reaction rolls are a big deal in old school D&D, but it's something that you can and I would say should use in any version of the game. But when you have an encounter, that doesn't mean it's a combat, it means it's an encounter. And uh, so I use this table and it's a 2D6 roll. I And I love 2D6 rolls because they give you this range where you have these rolls that are more likely or not are going to be these more neutral ones. But they give you chances for things to happen that are either really bad or really good. Well, I had made this encounter roll. And it um, it had been in the three to five range, if, if I remember correctly. And um, so they were getting ready to attack. And then in the middle of this, and there were tons of guards in there. That was the other thing. It was the main guy, the lead, the leader, and there were guards. And I rolled the timer die and I rolled a one. And so they knew in one round, more guards were coming up. And so they were going to be way outnumbered. I didn't change it. I didn't fudge the timer die and make it four rounds. So it took longer. I didn't do any of that. They're over. They're already kind of in a situation where they're not, um, they're not in it. And it, at an advantage and then more guards are coming. Okay, so there's no balance here. How are they gonna get out of this encounter? They went into it knowing full well that they were walking into the lion's den, but that was the choice they made. But then the two elf players got very creative. So um, Scabs ends up showing up and he uh, of course was supposed to be dead. It was a fake death. It was like a quick acting poison that made it look like he was dead. And he shows up with the assassin and there's this crazy situation going on because the head of the swine gang here is trying to attack them with these two meat cleavers. And so the elf player that knew charm person cast charm person. She'd never used this spell before and he failed his save. And so she's like, we are friends. You need to protect us. And so he turns to start attacking scabs and the assassin who meanwhile have grabbed this item that scabs had said he was hired to get and that this guy had and he and they run out of there and so um uh and and so in the middle of all of that happening then the other guards are trying to attack the player characters and so then the other elf character that had just learned ventriloquism she was like hey wait a second I'm going to use ventriloquism to make it sound like the captain of the guard has shown up with her troops, like just outside the door or something like that. And then can we try to look for a trap door or, or some kind of similar thing to like get out of this room? 
I hadn't planned for there to be a trap door there, but they were being so creative and showing a lot of ingenuity and cleverness. I didn't want to say, no, there's no trap door. Um, I guess I could have rolled the dice to see if there was one, but in this particular case, I, I didn't think that was necessary. So I just said, yeah, um, you you spy one like you're an elf you're good at this kind of stuff you spy that there's a trap door over there and so she uses ventriloquism to make it sound like there's commotion out in the hallway and it's the captain of the guard she's not mimicking the voice but they don't even know what the captain of the guard sounds like so it didn't matter and so they're distracted long enough for her and the other players to get out of there they go through the trap door and then the other elf players because there's two that back and forth um her other spell that she had is, is hold portal. She's used it maybe once the entire 16 sessions. This was the second time. And she cast hold portal on the trap door so that they could get away. And I thought like, that is really, really clever. They got out of this situation. Now they didn't necessarily get what they came there for, which was, they were trying to find out information on this, um, it was called, I think, the Green Skull. It was the Demon Skull. It's called the Demon Skull. And that's what Scabs broke in there to steal. And he was using the characters as bait to figure out a way to get in because he wasn't smart enough to figure that out. And then he thought that if they could distract these people long enough, he could take this Demon Skull. So now they're mad at Scabs because he betrayed them. And um, they know that now the swine gang's on their tail, but at least they got out of there. But, um, you know, again, I didn't balance this encounter. It was completely unfair. Half, had they chosen to go into combat, they most likely it would have been a TPK because there were too many people in there. But they figured out on their own that this was beyond their ability to to fix. And then they came up with a solution to get out of there. I didn't come up with a solution for them. They did that on their own. So that's just a quick catch up on what was happening in, in my player's game. Um, as I do these DM advice videos, I am kind of trying to go in order of like keeping the campaign consistent in terms of what they were doing. And then what I do is go back and look at like, what are some key things I can pull out of that to use as themes for a particular video when I'm doing these DM advice videos. So this one on encounter building, my point of all of this is that and I, I probably didn't make it too strong, but I'm going to get to that in a second. Uh, you know, again, I, I'm not changing the encounters. I know a lot of people, like, especially in old school adventures, sometimes you'll do things where like on level three, there'll be a dragon or something for, for a, an adventure that was designed for first through third level characters. And if you go too far into the dungeon, there's a dragon and people go like, that's ridiculous. Why would you put a dragon there? Like first level characters can't, can't fight a dragon. Of course they can't. That's the point. Things live in this world this world is supposed to be when you're running a campaign it's a living and breathing place the world doesn't limit itself to things that the characters can only deal with it's not able to shield itself off and then open it up um, as the characters go up and level and that is part of the complication that you encounter in a class and level system of game is that as the players move up in in level if you go by something like a challenge rating, this happened to me in a third level game, or I'm sorry, a third edition game that I played in. As the characters went up in level, we stopped fighting things that were lower level than us. And we started dealing with things that were like at our level or maybe a little bit above um, challenging. But it, it, it's almost like the things that were challenging us when we were at first or second level, like those things just didn't exist in the world anymore. We never saw any of those types of things again. Now, partly that's just the way the dungeon master ran this game and it's not a fault. It's just the way that he ran it. And, um, one of the unique things that he did was create this organization that was built on the concept that, um, it was like a cult. And so the lowest level of the cult were like first level characters that were led by like a, a third level character, for example. And then that third level character was part of another group of third level characters that were led by like a fifth level character. So as we went up in level, we would encounter the next level of this cult because they would kept they would keep sending the higher levels after us to kind of deal with us. So it sort of made sense, but that was his artificial way of trying to work within the challenge rating system. But in other versions of the game, like if orcs are bothering a town, those orcs don't disappear because the characters are now ninth level. They're still around. Now you can say, oh, well, we pass that off to the lower level adventures. But why would you do that? What, you know, you, you don't, um, you don't put your B team in 
uh, because you're eight, like, you know, if you've got an eight team and, and you're playing people that are weaker than you, you don't, you don't necessarily put in your lower level characters, your lower level, level players, your less experienced players, if you need to win, right? Maybe you give them, a ch- you know, the other people a chance to kind of shine in a little bit, but you're just going to have those, those more experienced players. I'm not making a great analogy here. And I apologize again, I'm six. So I'm not necessarily thinking hundred percent clearly, but I think you get the point that I'm making. And so the reverse of that to me is also true. These things exist in the world. And so that the way that the characters interact with them is by figuring out what is in the world. And they do that through investigation and exploration. They talk to people, they talk to NPCs, which is something that my players enjoy. They enjoy NPC interactions and they get rumors. And I have t- every session, I have tons of rumor tables um, that I use and I update them all the time. And I usually put them on that message board. You've seen that before, um, but where they get all these, you know, at the tavern and things like this, they get all of these different um, ideas. And I have like notes for each NPC, like what they might say to them. And so they, that's intelligence gathering. And then they use that to know that things are going to happen. So Professor Dungeon Master, again, on Dungeon Craft, just reposted his video on pig-faced orcs. He reposted it, um, well, actually today, today's March 18th of 2024. He had posted it before and then took it down and reshot it and posted it again. But one of the things he talked about there is how in this module, which is the adventure that my characters were still going through at the time that this happened, this is Keep on the Borderlands from 1979. And uh, here on page 15, okay, so the orc lair. And he said, this is the most dangerous encounter in any old school D&D product by TSR. And it's so it's the orc uh Sorry, I'm on page 11, but it's supposed to be on page 15. It's the orc lair. And if you look at the orc lair, and it talks about like all the different characters that are in here. So there's a watcher orc. Okay, fine. And then there's a guard room with four orcs. And then there's 12 male orcs. And then there's the orc leader who's bigger and stronger than everybody else. And then over here, there are more orcs. There's the, the two orc leaders that are there. And there's nine orcs and there's giant centipedes. And then there's like more orcs here. And then there's another guard. So there are like, you know, dozens and dozens, like two dozen orcs, I think roughly, or could be more um, in that thing. And that's just one cave, or maybe it's like two caves combined, whatever it is. There's a lot of orcs there. Okay. And so if you are first to third level and you go to the orc cave, which is on a higher elevation of these, um, this, like, it's a big hollowed out. Um, it's almost like a meteor crash and hollowed this big space out is kind of what is like big, um, like a chasm and the cave walls are kind of, you know, dotted in, in it. And so, If you and they specifically tell you the lower level caves are where the weaker monsters are and the higher up in elevation you go, the more tough the monsters are. And you learn that while you're at the keep. So if you just go right to the top, which is closer to where the orcs are, that's a tougher encounter, but you're aware of that. And so you might wait until you're higher in level in order order to be able to take care of that. But if you go there as first level, I'm not going to change the encounter and say there's fewer orcs there or they're not as strong or like whatever. That was your choice. You're going to deal with the consequences. So when my players dealt with the orc lair, they um, they equipped themselves ahead of time. So at the time, there were six players, not four, because this is before the sisters had left. Um, Each of them, each player had hired at least one higher length. Um, one of them had like maybe two or something like that. So you've doubled the number of characters and they had recruited the help of um, uh, the acolytes of like the local, like the the church people. Um, The cleric player had worked on this. And so they had some low level acolytes that were essentially there for healing purposes if they needed it. And, um, And so they were really well stocked in terms of extra manpower to go into the orc caves. And as it was, they, it was brutal. They were getting, um, kind of wrecked and, and they were, um, they lost like, I think most of their hirelings, um, not all of them, but most of them. And a couple of the player characters were, um, uh, unconscious. So I do in my game, I do, if you're at zero, you're unconscious. And then if you're at negative one or below, you're dead. And, um, through miracle of dice rolling, and this was all done out in the open, two of the characters had been reduced to exactly zero. So they weren't dead, but they were unconscious and they, they were basically out of the fight. And, it was at that point where they were encountering the orc chief who was the big nasty orc chief, like way more powerful. And 
um, he had this like big mutant like dog thing with them. I did talk about this a little bit before, but I didn't really talk about how this happened. So what happened in this particular situation was the um, the characters had killed most of the orc guards, but not the chief. And then they killed the chief's dog. And I, th I thought, you know what? I need to roll a morale check for this orc. And again, that is a 2d6 table. It goes from 2 to 12. And um, uh, actually, no, I, I apologize. The morale check, you still roll 2d6, but it's not a table. You're trying to um, meet or uh, exceed the character's morale rating. And this orc had a morale rating of 11. So the only way you can exceed that as on a 2d6 roll is to roll 2d6 and roll both sixes and get a 12. And so I rolled my two sixes or my six sided dice in this case, you know, I didn't get the numbers, but when I rolled it in the game, I got two sixes and I got a 12. I did not expect that. I had not prescripted that. And, um, had I thought, you know, ahead of time, I never in a million years would have thought that that was going to happen because his morale was so high, but it was actually one of the players that reminded me like, Hey, should you check his morale? And I was like, you know, I totally should because he's, he's by himself now, even though he does, he did have the upper hand and had combat ensued, he would have handily beaten them. But I rolled his morale and I was like, you know, he's upset. And so I talked about how like I leaned into the fact that like he was upset that they killed his dog. And so the deal that they came to is that he let them leave as long as, um, you know, they just left. And so they left a huge swath of the orc lair, um, unexplored, but that was their choice to get out of there alive. And if they ever want to go back, they can, um, things will be different if they go back, but it's not going to stay static. But again, I didn't balance that encounter. It, you, there was a ton of orcs in there and they got their asses whooped. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have cursed like that during my video. I apologize for that. Um, but they, um, you know, they, they, they took a lot of damage. And so, um, another situation came up. It was with these guys. It was with this, uh, these orc people are not orc people, the swine gang. So the, after they escaped that, I told you they, they did the whole portal thing and they escaped and, um, made their way out later on. They're exploring the town and they're trying to get some more clues on where this demon school thing is. They're trying to find scabs who ran away with that. And they got turned around and I had some notes in here about when they're moving through the city. I think it came up in the next session and yeah, so I didn't, it did, they didn't finish everything at the time. So I had all these notes and I talked about how, um, they were getting a little bit lost in the city and cause it was really crowded. And so I can't find it right now, but I had some mechanics for like getting lost in the city and, um, it was it's some fun dice mechanics and they got lost and went down this, um, uh, like alleyway that was a dead end. And they didn't figure it out until too late. So they got into the alleyway and, um, and then when they turned around, this, this guy was, where was it? This guy was blocking the end of the alleyway. So they couldn't get out and he had his two meat clearers. And he's like, here, picky, picky, picky. It was supposed to be really creepy. And they were like, what that? And then the cleric player's like, I'm going to talk to him. And, and I was like, you're going to do what? Like this guy's going to attack. Now I could have just made the decision at the DM that like, no, nope, no talking's going to work. And um, because this guy was very upset, he was very violent, he was just going to attack. But I was like, I want to see where this goes. And that's part of like, as a DM, what I love is I love being surprised by what my players do. And especially in my daughter's game, because they're younger, they are sort of uninhibited in the way that they use their imagination and creativity that adults, as we kind of lose that as we get older, because we've consumed so much pop culture media that tells us what's cool and what's not cool. And so we wouldn't necessarily think in that situation, like I'm going to chat this guy up. In this case, it was the dad player that said it, it was the you news know, place, the cleric. He says, I want to chat this guy up because he kind of realized like they were in a bad situation. This guy has him cornered. They didn't real, they didn't know if the rest of his gang was, was nearby. And so I said, okay, well, what are you trying to do? And they knew that the captain of the guard um, and the watch were out looking for this guy as well. And so what the cleric player said was, I want to talk to him and basically see if I can stall him long enough until she shows up. Now, once again, that was nothing that I had ever anticipated was going to happen in this game. I hadn't planned for that. I didn't have a scenario for that happening. Like, how am I going to do this? But I thought that's clever. He's trying to get out of this without combat. And so um, I rolled a uh, a reaction roll. The cleric rolled really, really well. So not enough to like make this guy friendly by any means, but enough to 
engaging conversation where this guy didn't attack right away. And that stalling was long enough where I did roll, roll a die. I think I rolled a D4 and I said, okay, this is when the watch is going to show up because he rolled well enough on his thing. And it ended up being like two rounds. So 12 seconds. It was like, you can get by for two rounds. And so he kept talking. And by the time this guy realized what was going on and started to attack, the watch showed up. And so there was no combat at all. And what I had anticipated to be kind of like this big climactic battle with this guy, um, as it turned out, he just got captured by the watch. And again, I know a lot of DMs would think like, maybe that's unsatisfying or that's not how I thought it was going to happen. And that's not how I wrote it out. Well, I didn't write it out. And so, excuse me really quick. <laughs> I'm so sorry, folks. I didn't write it out ahead of time. And so the um, the situation unfolded and I was super happy with, with how it ended because that's not what I thought was going to happen. And I got to be surprised by that. So using dice in those situations like stalling this guy or rolling the reaction roll or the morale roll on the orc chieftain, things like that where you're rolling dice. There's a great blog post written by James. I think it's pronounced Malachewski, although I've never seen it. Um, I've never heard it pronounced. It's spelled phonetically Malazuski, um, but I, I had a teacher in college that had a very similar name, and so my my thinking is that I think it's pronounced Malachewski. But in any event, um, James runs a blog uh, called Grognardia, and that was the blog that got me interested in re-exploring old school Dungeons and Dragons and early versions of the game because I, I discovered it in 2008, right? As D&D was transitioning from third edition to fourth edition, I was heavily invested in a third edition game. But reading James's blog um, really got me kind of reinvigorated to kind of re-explore old school D&D. And so he wrote a blog post in April of 2008 um, called The Oracular Power of Dice. But the idea is that rolling dice is part of the game. So these are games. They're not stories and games have rules. And part of the rules is that you roll dice and you, you know, I know there's a lot of things back and forth. Like, should you fudge dice? Should you not fudge dice? If you fudge dice, are you even really playing? And then if you're going to fudge it, why are you rolling it anyway? There's no right or wrong folks. Like if you want to fudge dice, do it. That's, that's fine. I choose not to do that. Um, I used to, I totally used to do that because I didn't think the players were going to be satisfied if they didn't win. And I had a player quit a game uh, that I was running third edition because he said like, basically it seems like this game is a story about this other guy's character and the rest of us are just kind of along for the ride. And no, there's no consequences for anything. We're never in danger and nobody ever dies. And I don't like this. And it was a fair criticism. Um, could have been solved in a session zero had we done that back then. He joined the game late. He wasn't an original player. He joined late and he left. And um, I was really upset at the time. And uh, I still game with the guy in a completely different game, Savage Worlds. And he's he's a nice person. He's, you know, we're friends. Um, that game wasn't for him. And so I kind of, it made me rethink about how I ran games. And I, I did realize that like part of why I like rolling the dice as a DM for situations like this is that I then get to be surprised by what's happening. And also the players get to be more creative trying to figure their way out of situations that aren't designed to keep them alive. These situations aren't designed to kill them either. They're just there and they get to respond to those and come up with ways and seeing the looks on my players faces when they're anxious, when they're rolling die and they're going to see what's happened. It's so fulfilling because I've seen the other side of that where they players know whether they roll well or whether they roll poorly or, or it's not going to matter because they're still going to get out of it. They might get frustrated that they're rolling poorly because it takes them longer to do the thing. Um, but I just don't like playing that way anymore because it's not satisfying for me either. It, it's basically just me telling them a story and they're, and the, they're acting out what I thought I wanted them to do. And I, I, I don't enjoy that. So um, definitely, I think the way that I approach the game, and this isn't a novel thing, this isn't something I created or made up, but it's the way that I approach the game, is that I'm there to design um, an environment for the characters to act within. And part of that environment is to create challenges for them to overcome. It's the player's job to then describe how they want to overcome that challenge. 
And then it's the job of the dice to determine whether those decisions are successful. Now, every once in a while, the players will say, I want to do X. And if I think that there's no reason for there to be failure or there's no consequence for fail, I will just say, yes, you can do the thing. And there's no dice rolling. But for situations where there would be a negative consequence if they fail, then you roll the dice and you let them roll where they fall and you narrate the situation. Okay, it doesn't always mean someone dies or whatever, but there will be a complication if there's a failure. And that's part of the fun of this. And it's also why I don't find a need to try to balance encounters. I don't change it like if a player at the last minute says that they can't show up and we want to play anyway with who's left. I don't change anything that I've written. It's still what it is. And then it's up for the players to decide if they are well equipped enough to take on that situation, knowing that they're a player down. So I hope that all makes sense. Uh, I apologize for coughing there for a second. I apologize for my voice, but I hope that um, you uh, got something out of this video. And I would love to hear your thoughts on bouncing encounters and whether you fudge dice or not. And, um, and you know, be honest, because a lot of old timers will really get really dogmatic about like, you never fudge dice. But when I was a kid, even we did all the time. So I know the DM was fudging the dice. So it, it's not... This isn't a new thing to fudge die. It's been around since the game's been invented. So, um, but I would like to hear other players' perspectives and, and really how they handle it in their games and um, and uh, other ideas for balancing encounters or if you think that that's a thing that needs to be done, um, especially in an old school game that, again, doesn't use those mathematical formulas as much. I mean, there's stuff in there about, you know, the XP value and, and the, and the treasure value where you can kind of back into it, but I just don't care about that. So I do it more from just a feel. So, um, that's going to be it for now for this particular video. I know it was quick. I, I'm sorry. It was a little bit rambling uh, again. I, I, um, I, I'm sick, but I wanted to make sure I had a video out this week. And, um, so I hope you can overlook all those deficiencies with this video. And um, with that, I would like to thank you um, very much for watching. If you could please um, help support the video by liking it, subscribing to the channel and sharing it. Um, look me up on social media to interact with me there. I'm on all the main channels. And then if you could support the channel by buying something at my shop, I would really, really appreciate it. Um, I do have a new design out that I talked about last time that I think is kind of fun. And um, lastly, find me on my blog as well, where you can um, you know, see content that I've been creating. And uh, that said, uh, please um, thank you again for watching my video. Happy gaming, stay safe, and I'll talk to you next time. Now for the bonus content, what I've been drinking, what I was listening to when I worked on this particular video. So, um, Again, I'm just not feeling well. I'm, I'm on antibiotics for, for um, my sinus infection, which is starting to clear up, believe it or not, despite my voice. So again, apologies for the um, kind of different sounding voice. And uh, I had a few coughs and, and throat clearings during that video. Then I try to really avoid that when I'm doing these. So um, apologies. But anyway, I just made some fresh uh, squeezed orange juice. There's nothing fancy, but I use these little ones. Um, we got these at Trader, I think it was Trader Joe's in a little bag and they call them cuties, but I think, um, uh, they're like mandarin oranges, but I just kind of sliced them this way. And then I use, I have a lemon squeezer that I use when I make cocktails and I just put that in. So, uh, just a tiny bit of fresh juice, which is, um, to me better tasting and actually cheaper than, uh, than if I were to have just bought juice. It looks like I got some seeds in there, but in any event. Mm -hmm. And um, this is not something I would normally listen to. So I, I do own this. This is the Batman. I guess it's soundtracks um, from the 1989 Michael Keaton Batman. So um, interesting story about. So this is the 35th year. It's 35th anniversary of the Michael Keaton version of Batman coming up. The Tim Burton one, which kind of helped reinvigorate the um, superhero movies that had kind of fallen into um, you know, where people weren't really into it, um, due to the ongoing, um, later, um, Christopher Reeves, Superman's, especially Superman four was kind of a real disappointment. And, um, so I, there was kind of a period of time there, if you can believe it or not, given the day and age we live now where people weren't really making superhero movies. And so Batman was a huge craze. Um, when it came out, this symbol was everywhere. And that's the reason I was listening to this was because on Twitter, it came up 
one of my friends is an artist, uh, lost in Wallace. And, um, he showed a photo of him, um, back in the day and he was wearing a, a, a Batman t-shirt with this symbol on it. And he had the mullet haircut. It was hilarious. And it was from 1989. He just mentioned that like back then this was everywhere. And all these people jumped on, um, into this tweet he tagged me in the tweet and as he normally does and um all these people jumped on and said like i remember that that shirt was everywhere and so i just been getting comment after comment after comment of all these people because i was tagged in the original post um uh talking about um you know that this symbol was everywhere back then and i thought it would be fun to dig this out now this is an original this is from 1989 first pressing um and it was still in the shrink wrap however the shrink wrap had been open, which is fine. Uh, the record was in great shape. I bought this at my local flea market um, a couple of years ago. Um, they had it there. And uh, so um, I just thought it would be fun to bring this out because everybody was talking about um, the 1989 Batman. So I, I put this on for a spin. I've not listened to it, I think, since I got it. Um, back when the movie came out, um, I was much more interested in the score by Danny Elfman. I was a huge Oingo Boingo fan. Um, the first band I ever saw in concert was Oingo Boingo. And so I was, I was really big into the Danny Elfman score. And um, I had, I remember asking my mom for the Batman's and I didn't understand back then the difference between the term score and soundtrack. And I asked for it for Christmas and she got me this on cassette um, which I unfortunately don't have anymore. I got rid of most of my cassettes, which I regret now. But um, anyway, uh, that's the vinyl. I just thought it would be fun to look at that. So uh, that is it. Again, thanks so much for watching. Apologies again for my voice and for the coughing during the videos and the throat clearings and stuff like that. And, and for the rambling a little bit. I know it was kind of rambling, but I hope that you did get my point that, um, again, I don't balance my encounters, but the reasons why, and then how I adjust for that using dice um, and also giving information to my players should they decide to seek it out and then relying on the player ingenuity and for them to make good decisions in order to avoid any unpleasantries that might come from a so-called unbalanced encounter. Um, but in any event, thanks again for sticking through the bonus content and do me a favor, please, and watch um, some of these other videos over here and I will talk to you next time.